and we're live. So, is Amazon trying to build a wall to block YouTube? Will Twitter double your tweet size? And why did Bill Gates switch to an Android? Plus, we've got a terrific guest lined up. Dom Esposito joins the show this week to share his thoughts on Apple's iPhone 8 and 8 Plus. We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 272 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded September 28th at noon Pacific, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile, smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid and naming technology products was even more screwed up than it is today. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at pocketnow.com, joined as always by plucky podcast producer, Mr. Jules Wong out on the East Coast. How's it going, buddy? Boy. So I didn't know that ZTE could spell multi with a Y. Like that was that was one of the things that we saw earlier on right. this month. So I've just yeah, just a lot of that too. Fun. You know, like we just recently published our iPhone 8 uh, camera review. And a lot of people are really flipping out about the name. This is really just an iPhone 7S. And you're like, well, yeah, that doesn't really change anything. You know, it's like going from a Note 5 to a Note 7. It's like going from Windows 8 to Windows 10. I, I just like that doesn't really mean anything these days. You kind of just have to get on with your life that, you know, the, the iPhone number letter combination isn't sacrosanct. It's not, you know, carved in stone tablets. I mean, I'm I'm kind of pissed off that nine might or might not get the shaft here, but I mean, maybe it's going to turn up in the Galaxy S9, but I, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll be really excited. We're going to be bringing Dom on uh, a little bit later in the show. And that's actually one of the things I want to ask him is like, where do we go from here? You know, an iPhone 9 is going to feel like a consolation prize, but it'll end up having probably better hardware than the iPhone. I, I mean, like where apple needs to lead the industry like it kind of hurts my brain when we do talk about the, yeah. the naming nomenclature we, we have a lot of philosophy philosophy philosophical points that we have to get to <laughs> and but we also want to hear from you. philosophy that's exactly where i wanted to go next Jules. your You're philosophy mine. <laughs> your your views and your comments because as we're taping this live at uh whenever we're taping this uh is you can actually Re react, respond, and ask us questions using Twitter and that PN Weekly hashtag. And uh, that's where you'll see other people ask questions and we'll be responding as we can over the course of the next 60 minutes or so. And if you can't make it, then obviously you have the emails that you can do. Podcast at pocketnow.com is where you should send those along to. So hashtag PN Weekly Pocket. Pocket Now podcast at pocketnow.com is uh, they're all places that you can reach us, uh, reach out and touch faith. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. totally a saying that people use your own personal pocket. Uh, <laughs> your own pocket. We come from a land in your pocket. No, that's that doesn't that doesn't work. I, I can't. No, I can't. That, I'm, that's wrong. I've never been good at that like switch up a song lyrics in the moment kind of a thing. So I, I unfortunately can't yes and you right there. But what we can do is jump into some yeah. really fun tech topics. We had some uh, some of the hot new headlines on uh, pocketnow.com, some of the top stories of the week. And I think they make for some interesting discussion on just sort of the nature of where industry and services are going right now. These are just burning hot. So for the week of uh, September 24th, Fourth, this is all the news that is fit to podcast, and we begin with Amazon and YouTube at it again, with fighting each other. Uh, they've been holding hands in terms of being able to supply media to us with Chromecasts and Echoes, but now there is a little shift because with the Echo Show, the first uh, Alexa speaker with a screen on it from Amazon pull out of it. Google decided to pull that away, apparently, and that's according to Amazon, at least, and they haven't been told why. Google did say that there was a terms of use violation, but and there was some sort of broken UI element that uh, was not really optimal for them, but there hasn't been really any clarification on that, so we hope to see that cleared up. By the way, uh, you can't find a Chromecast on Amazon still. That's still an issue that has been long been running. Uh, we also have Twitter edit button. So um, 
So uh, good luck to you if you try to uh, write something very, very long and uh, end up embarrassing yourself in the first place. But uh, at least you can write uh, more than you have uh, starting soon. 280 characters is double the current 140 limit that we have right now. And uh, we shall see that rolling out. CEO Jack Dorsey uh, and also a co co-founder uh, Biz Stone uh, provided the first uh, couple of ceremonial tweets. So um, uh, people, there have been hot takes all across the internet about different uh, character lengths and not being able to finish tweets, um, which is interesting. I think. I think. I think we should just limit it to twenty-five. <laughs> interesting is is a tweet. good word. I actually we'll we'll talk about that just when we're through the news block because I've got some thoughts. Yeah. So uh, Bill Gates is using Android these days. The former Microsoft CEO says that he actually does, you know, well, part of it is what we'll get into with uh, this topic, and that is uh, current CEO Satya Nadella's new book, Hit Refresh, and it goes into his, uh, what, nearly three decades at Microsoft talking about how empathy and culture really change uh, a company. <laughs> like it was hard for you not to restrain like some snarkiness on that. <laughs> some empathy from Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, credit to, you know, where credit's due because, you know, it's actually a good read that I suggest that you all should uh, take a look at at the very least, but some interesting excerpts from it. Uh, go through the time when they kind of uh, dropped the ball on mobile and uh, yeah. with that Nokia thing, uh, that Nokia acquisition that turned into a write-off. Nadella was never really for it in the first place and uh, when the transition from uh, Steve Ballmer to Nadella took place after that deal went down, it, I mean, it's uh, we didn't see them do anything that is meaningfully like excellent they had flagships were being dropped left and right and there was all this um you know just mid-range middling uh serve the uh base market the low-end market and i i mean the fans were disappointed i think I'll... would it be weird for me to say that a fan base drove that kind of market you know so that no I, I don't think i don't think it's weird at all because i think so many companies initially get their kickoff or get their start by trying to court some type of user base that will be advocates for that platform and i i think a terrific example of that is a company like oneplus you know they they built uh, so much of their brand credibility on a marketing message which appealed to a very specific demographic and now they're trying to pivot and they're trying to grow and become more of a mainstream or a broader product. Um, it's it's interesting hearing, I mean, you know, getting that kind of insight or that confirmation from uh, from Nadella that he wasn't on board because what we saw were actions from Microsoft that didn't really seem to be promoting or or aggressively building in the mobile space. I think if if we could learn anything from the launch of the iPhone is that you can be late to the game if you bring something of substance. And to Nadella's point, he didn't feel like Microsoft was really rewriting the rules on mobile. I can't remember exactly what his quote is, but it's something along those lines. But it also didn't seem like they were really investing the resources to rewrite the <laughs> rules on mobile. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of a, a doomed position. Um, he walked into a situation that he obviously didn't support. And then once, you know, that that acquisition was finalized, he still wasn't really supporting that move. We know that Nadell is really a services and server guy. And that's where, I mean, to Microsoft's credit, we've seen some terrific improvements to services like Office and OneDrive, making them far more accessible, a lot more cross-platform. Cross you know, it's, it's not, you know, a terrible situation when I'm on a Chromebook or an iPad or an Android tablet or you know a, a desktop and I can kind of get all of the same writing and spreadsheets and presentations work done. It doesn't really matter what I'm on. Um, I, I, I wrote uh, I wrote this really in-depth letter to a senator the other day and my wife took a look at it on OneDrive. We were editing, editing it together and then I finished it on a phone. That used to be something that I would only rely on, on Google Docs for and now <laughs> Office is finally like caught up in a really meaningful way. Um, so when uh, when we're looking at Windows Phone, it's really a shame because they took some of the most talented hardware designers and engineers in the world, the old Nokia team, 
uh, they took a ton of goodwill and they built up rapidly um, a user base that was actually pretty formidable as a distant third place competitor and then just kind of threw it all away. And I think that's yeah, ultimately it was sort of like just lifting a rock and then putting it on your feet. And it was, there was no, <laughs> there's no purpose to it. But I do think, well, you say this that rock's in my way. Let me move it, and let me move it by crushing my ankle. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, but you know, I think you know, Nadella was a software and servers guy. I mean, Microsoft was a software and servers company. Yeah, you could see, well, it, it was mean, winning. It didn't really start. You know, they didn't really give an eye towards hardware until the Surface Initiative, which well, you know they've been barely kind of juggling together. They had the whole. You know, they were still trying of, to figure out RT and all that. It's one of the interesting things about Microsoft is that we do kind of forget that this company actually doesn't suck at hardware. We've got multiple generations of the Xbox. We've got living room computing that yeah. was way ahead of its time. I mean, you think about all of the security, doom and gloom, Microsoft spying on you with the Kinect, and now we're all rushing to throw Amazon and Google and Apple talking, listening, always on microphones into our living room. Um, That's always that mobile computing component that they all that, that they, they can't yeah. seem to get right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and that to me, I think is one of the most upsetting because. Windows 8, especially Windows 8.1, once we started getting some of the, the Nokia firmwares like Denim for Windows 8, Windows, Windows Phone 8.1, they were so, they were so close. They were so close, I think, to something really, truly disruptive. And then they kind of backed off and walked away. And I think all of our listeners and subscribers kind of remember just how crestfallen a lot of us were. I was, I was, I was in, I was sold. I was ready to, to be a Windows Phone kid. Um, and they just couldn't make that final push into, again, pivoting into a more mass market direction. Um, that, that actually kind of like just that little bit of speculation that I want to throw out there. I think it is kind of interesting that Bill Gates made a point out of saying that he was using an Android phone. That, that's like the final nail in the coffin for any yeah. kind of discrete mobile uh, solution for Microsoft in the foreseeable future is when... You've, you've got the most recognizable Microsoft name publicly talking about using a competitor's product. I mean, it, I mean, it's a shame, but where else does the actual company lead them to? We haven't, you know, they have, they just subtly shifted everything from this, uh, the main uh, trunk development to a side branch that's going to get an end of life and uh, it might be but, working on something, but we've, there's but always you, been, the, you know, something in the background. But don't you think it's interesting, Jules, that he made such a point out of saying Android and that he was not using an iPhone? Because right now, I think Google is the bigger threat to Microsoft than Apple is. Like, increasingly, Apple and Microsoft, the overlap on potential consumers, I think, is getting smaller and smaller. But Google is taking this big move towards software and services. Again, kind of like Microsoft's bread and butter. You know, I, like I said, I, I tend to prefer working in Word, but you know, Google Docs could easily replace what I'm doing if if I wanted it to, and I wouldn't have to pay for my yearly office subscription uh, to boot, you know? So well, it's those kinds of things that I thought it was really interesting that I, I, I think the more dangerous competitor for Microsoft is the one that he talked about for picking up a new phone. I mean, I think he's pretty savvy enough to know that there are both sides to the whole open source thing, which he's always been a fan of. That's true, that's very true. And and, you know, being part of, you know, it, it's not just Google, it's the individual OEMs that play a part in making that ecosystem happen. So in terms of doing more or less damage to Microsoft, if he's still, if he, you know, he's always got that in the back of his mind, I think Android would have been the optimal solution. Now, we don't know which device exactly he chose for the so wild driver, speculation so. tools on the spot. You're Bill Gates. You're probably like one of the, if not the richest man on the planet. <laughs> you are using which Android phone go? Honestly, I would say a Moto, a Moto Z. Interesting. X. No, X. I would say an X. You think I think that a would Moto be X? more his style, but it's not current. I know that, but if I were just to be just Bill Gates and not with all this uh, withstanding, just uh, a Moto X, I think it's just... Uh... So I, I think if he doesn't have a custom-built phone made out of unobtainium, uh, I'm going to go... See, I think a Galaxy is just too obvious. I think you're right. He'd probably want something business-grade. 
he probably wouldn't <laughs> excuse me he probably wouldn't opt for the blackberry uh, i you know i'm torn i want to say he'd probably go with something like a note because it's got the stylus really i, I, think I mean so. he's he does have a lot of foundational work uh, with uh, Melinda, his wife, and yeah, I, I, or, I, but I know, don't the, know because he has people that can do like all of the 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 piddly, you know, secretarial work for him. Maybe instead, yeah. maybe he's just on something totally goofy. Like he's got an Honor Six X, and that's all he needs to like check his email and and open up Word documents or something like that. Hmm, interesting. Well, I think uh, I can uh, agree with that, uh, but. Personally, I think he's just more of a... Re- he's always had that rebel bullet in him, and he wants to express rebel himself yell. in a certain way. So, I mean, so, still having uh, that monomaker. I don't know what currently he would choose, though. I don't know. I'm, I'm really torn because, like, you know, I, I think it would be something sensible and practical. Yes. I don't think it would be something outlandish. I, I would love to see Bill Gates roll up in, like, an old Virtu just because it's covered in <laughs> sapphires or something. Uh, using the PN Weekly hashtag from Peter Hayton, Uh, Does using an Android suggest Microsoft has a clear vision to where they want to go, providing stronger software cross-platform? I think that's a that's a pretty clear indication of what Microsoft is focused on. What do you think, Jules? Uh, I the question because I'm I'm trying to talk with Dom, BTS, inside (laughs) baseball. We're we're trying to. Yeah, you're trying to make sure to he can actually join us for the show. That's probably smart it's, thinking there. Hello, Hangouts. But yeah, uh, what was the question again? I apologize. Uh, d- is having uh, is using an Android suggest Microsoft has a clear vision of where they want to go, providing stronger software cross-platform? I they've always done that with uh, Office and uh, making sure that their you know, or Skype or whatever their services are that in the past couple of years they've had it on Android first uh, mm-hmm. not necessarily iOS I feel, I feel like you know it's always been that much of a of a lean towards that uh, market advantage but um in terms well, of uh, just it's just not I, I I don't think Bill Gates is like totally representative of the moving and breathing <laughs> well but but organism think, that is Microsoft I think what is what is kind of interesting is the notion like I really think he would be on something custom, maybe not custom hardware, but like working with Microsoft engineers on what can we do to Android to make it a Microsoft platform? You could replace Gmail with Outlook. You could replace uh, Google Assistant with uh, Cortana in a way that's reminiscent of using Amazon Alexa or uh, um, Bixby on a phone, Uh, you know, Office instead of Google Docs. I mean, I, I think that... There is the potential okay. to yeah. say, you know, platform doesn't matter. What matters is, do we have your services? Do we have your eyeballs? Do we have your data? Whatever glowing rectangle you want to use them from, that's fine. But we want you on a Microsoft launcher with Microsoft document support, with Microsoft video calling through Skype. You know, all of those things I think could go hand in hand uh, and- in, in a really well polished uh, package. I mean, is that what they were trying to do with CyanogenMod? I mean, yeah, but I'm for them. It'd be it'd have to be a commercial pursuit, and that would mean more. You know, we'd have to include Bing, and that would take <laughs> the Google that you know right, everyone so loves my, and Android out my, of the equation. My admission to this audience be, is is I actually do use Bing because I like getting gift certificates to Amazon. <laughs> really. I mean, I, yeah, no shame they're still, at all. They're still bribing you. So, I mean, like, it, it, it's hilarious that I would say probably three out of ten, I have to go to Google after the primary search results on Bing because, like, <laughs> Bing's not getting my Boolean. Uh, just, well, you know, I mean, answer. hey, you, you, but, you're one of the third <laughs> of the market share. That but, I mean, like, even, has, even huh? just this just this month, I, I, I racked up, like, another $5 credit to Amazon. If Microsoft wants to bribe me to keep their search up, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'll, I'll, I'll whore out Bing. It's fine. All right. Well, fine. I mean, DuckDuckGo. Just saying. <laughs> have you been using DuckDuckGo? I have not, actually. I have not. Oh, okay. I, I've just been curious. I don't like, care for are... anyone tracking me. It's like, you know, yeah, I, I, I live in this world. You can probably track me down if you wanted to, if you worked hard enough at it. And I would question your motivation. Yeah. But no, that's true. Uh, it, it's not like, you know, you don't see kind of, you know, 
uh, okay. information that you could use if if you were so inclined. Uh, on that on that point, um, I want to spend just a couple minutes here before we uh, we have to leave the news block. Twitter doubling the character count. Does this change anything? I, I, I don't understand a Twitter that's trying to become more of an in the moment micro blogging service as opposed to what they do really well, which is a streamlined presentation of information, uh, sort of up to the second. So they do that, not the user base. Like, is that that's that that's the thing, right? It's not. It's well, not like either, moments looking, has anything to do with. They are it looking because... at their concerns and saying, like, okay, I mean, yeah, you wanted to put more information into one tweet. We can increase the character count, but that's sort of. I, I feel like that's a never-ending problem. You know, you know, it, it becomes something of like a Google Plus kind of a situation. Do I really want? instant and disposable content creation that's then going to allow me to write multiple paragraphs you know like that doesn't really provide me any benefit over like a facebook well um, if we're talking about revenue generation for twitter because they're all about the revenue generation at twitter it's you, know, you have <laughs> they're more so content. good at it <laughs> you have more content that you squeeze without having to be rep repetitive or you know having to extend you know little tendrils of of threads going on there so you know making most of that, whatever, if it's just an extra 0.2 seconds of interaction that, you know, you have to scroll through on your feed and is, the you know, they kind of cop out and put up a little ellipses, you know, it gets truncated. <laughs> it's like, that's okay. What, what's the point then? Well, um, Twitter, I mean, the, the, they're looking for that much of an extra squeeze where they can. And I mean, if it's not... I get the I get the feeling that the edit button I think has been maligned, mm -hmm. rightly maligned. Um, that the decision to not do so, but I still I still don't. I I would say save the edit button. Um, well, it's a matter I, do, of public do, do, we, do we want do we want Twitter to stand as a platform of public record? I I am very much against Donald Trump having... doesn't want it to. Well, that, that. that's that's just it. Is I'm very much against um, Twitter introducing tools to change history or change discourse. Um, for for that reason, Twitter has become even even though it's not a profitable venture for for Twitter and the Twitter shareholders, uh, Twitter has kind of become something that we re, we we rely on as public record, and I think that's dangerous to allow people to change even if there's an asterisk oh this tweet was edited you don't necessarily know to what degree or how or you can't easily always backtrack or find like if someone didn't archive the original then you have no information as to what what transpired and and we're moving into a future where that kind of public record is going to become increasingly fluid so i i understand why people want an edit button button and it's always embarrassing i do this on the regular where i tweet something and go oh Oh, that's not really what I meant. <laughs> I have to like scramble and delete the tweet or just let it stand and sort of own my shame if I don't catch it right away. Um, but that, that's to me one of the things that I hope they hold off on for a while. But that still doesn't change this notion, though, that do I really need or do I really want more information per tweet when the, the, the joy of a service like Twitter is that I don't really get bogged down into it like i do with facebook or even with like youtube comments i mean i spent they had a chart that you know had a distribution of how many tweets were there that had this many characters and a lot more english tweets because of the syntax that we have to deal with with the characters it's you know they come close to that 140 line whereas japanese or uh chinese or whatever uh you know because of the symbolism in their characters that's right they drop down to more that's like true. 15 20 ish that's true so, well and, and that's i mean and, and that's only until we finally come full circle and only communicate through emoji as a return to hieroglyphics <laughs> and then um then i think our, that's the, honestly that's, that would be, be a good complete. idea we could kick, kick it down to 25 characters that'd be great. yeah if you, if you can't get your point across in 25 emojis then you're not interneting right right 
Indeed, indeed. Right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to call an audible on that one, though. <laughs> Literally, uh, because uh, before we bring on our, our amazing, awesome guest, Dom, to talk about the iPhone, we probably should take just a quick minute to talk about our sponsor. To thank our sponsor, this week's episode of the Pocket Now Weekly is brought to you by Audible. Now, Audible includes an unmatched selection of audio books, original shows, news, comedy, and more from leading publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, and business information providers. Now, unlike a streaming or a rental service with Audible, you own your book so you can access them anywhere, anytime, from almost any device. I love how they say almost any device, and then they list iPhone, iPad, Android, Amazon Fire tablets, and they still even support Windows phones. Our precious, beloved, um, dwindling population of people still using Windows phones, you can still get your Audible audiobooks. Audi Audible makes getting books in your life super easy. There's an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, all from uh, using terrific performers to narrate and voice the performance. And you can transform your commute and ride with Audible. My wife has a 90-minute commute each way. Uh, to get to work. And one of the ways that she remains sane is using Audible. And then also for me, I'm not in the car nearly as much as she is every day. But even when I go to pick up my daughter from daycare, uh, right now I'm part of an online book club. And this month we're reading The Three Body Problem. And I've been bouncing back and forth. This has actually really helped me kind of keep on top of a really in-depth, really cerebral science fiction uh, novel. And I can jump into the audiobook when I'm in the car. I kind of have to page through my paper book when I get back home to kind of catch up to where I left off. And that's all because of Audible. Get a free audiobook with a 30-day trial at www.audible.com slash pocket now. That, again, that's audible.com slash P-O-C-K-E-T-N-O-W. Even if you decide to cancel after that 30 days, that audiobook is still yours. Uh, once again, audible.com pocket now and we thank them for supporting the pocket now weekly and i see we've got a super cool dude in a super cool hat in a super cool location with some super cool headphones uh i don't know i can't see over my camera here dom is your mic still uh, muted you uh you with no. us now i'm with you all right excellent man thank you so yeah. much for joining us this week we for caught sure. one of you we caught your videos on the iphone and i was like i gotta we gotta have him on the show this is exactly <laughs> what we need to talk everybody think gonna think i'm the bad guy or something well, no, I, I think that's one of the things that's been interesting for Apple. I mean, there's a lot of talk about business, about strategy, about philosophy. Apple is a very philosophical company. And this launch this year, the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, just brings up a ton of questions as to what should we expect from a premium premier manufacturer? Where does this company go from here? So, I mean, I want to kick things off just to start. Like, what do you think of the phones? Uh, you know, I, I think you've made your thoughts kind of clear in your videos, but just as a nice like TLDR. Um, okay, so well, let's 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 put this out there first so that I don't get too much hate. Um, <laughs> my channel, my YouTube channel, started because of Apple products. Like I I started right. I only covered Apple products. Like that was the only thing I ever covered originally were, were Apple products or accessories or whatever related to Apple products. So I'm. You know, I'm a hardcore fan, like for sure. Um, but I came in late. I came in late in the game. I think my my first iPhone was the 4S. Um, okay. I was actually an Android user before. It's weird. I know it's weird. I I I, I was using Android, and then I I started uh, YouTube and stuff, and I got a 4S, and then I you know kept doing that, and then I diversified into Android again. So I'm a huge Apple fan. Like that's. It's just in, in the nature of my, my business and YouTube and whatever. And this, like, I've always been, like, super excited about iPhones. And this was the first year that I just, I just wasn't, I'm not very excited, you know? And, mm -hmm. and that's not a bad thing, okay? So, like, it's not like a, like, get out the pitchforks and start, you know, burning things kind of way. It's just, like, I, I get that there's only a certain level of innovation that you can do nowadays we've reached a pinnacle of smartphone technology like quite yeah. literally now personally in my opinion the iphone 8 and 8 plus were a total waste of time they just they just should have done an a, a 10 and a 10 plus like realistically or call that the 8 and the 8 plus you know what i mean and just and just right. done that and uh 
And that, that would have been for, I think for a lot of people more, more exciting. Um, uh, just a lot of general consumers that I've spoken with don't understand the eight versus 10 launch strategy. Like they just don't get it. They're confused by it. Like normal people, you know? Um, but right. I'm just, I'm just not excited. I don't know. Like, I mean, I, I have them obviously, like I have the phones and, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm using, I'm using the iPhone eight. I, I'm, I've never been a fan of the, of the plus size, even though I'm missing out on the portrait mode, that's never been a big deal to me. Um, but I just feel like I'm, you know, once I got my backup restored, I just feel like I'm holding an iPhone seven, you know, just right. And well, you know and, I mean? and we, we, I mean, like we mentioned, thing, but well, it, it, it's, it's like, you've got to play the Seinfeld game every time you talk yeah. about it. It's like, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think yeah. one of the interesting things has just been the psychology of people who are getting upset about the name that it's called the iPhone eight. And I can't tell you the number of angry comments we've had in our videos. Like, like, people legitimately getting fired up that it should be called the iPhone 7s. That's what I mean, it really is. And would that have made any difference in the perception of this product? Do you think? I, so the thing is, I, I think that I, I think it, the perception has a lot to do with all of the leaks and rumors that came out before now, which were all about the 10 essentially like everything we've seen up to, you know, for the most part, the bulk of the rumors were about like the full display, you know, right. like there were weird ones with the fingerprint sensor on the back. Then there were weird ones with it being in under the display, which is possible because of that qual uh, the with the Qualcomm tech, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Qualcomm's been working yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. With Vivo, I believe. Um, they had some some phones that they were demoing at a, an event in New York at one point. But um, so there were all these rumors and there were all these facts that lined up with the rumors and and then we saw at the last minute, I, I mean, relatively speaking, at the last minute, we saw leaks of what was the 8 and the 8 plus or whatever. And, and so up to that point, though, everybody was hyped about the 10 and everybody up uh, up to that point before we saw the 8 and 8 plus, everybody was thinking that the 10 was going to be called the 8, right? That was right. like how the rumors went. And so I think when it was revealed that, oh, you're getting the 8, here you go, but the 10... <laughs> You know, it's that, but right. again, but the, but the 10 is coming out in a month. So it just, I, I think that would have made a difference if they had la launched directly with the 10, maybe if they called it the seven S I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't know what they're doing anymore. I, they used like, to have like such a solid roadmap, you know, it's tough to explain. And it's also one of the first times that we've ever seen Apple. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to use a word like fragmentation, but it's one of the only times we, I've ever seen Apple have such a diverse spread of yeah. products under one label. Like you've got MacBook, MacBook Pro used to have iPhone and then used to have iPhone plus last year's iPhone. And then you had iPhone and iPhone plus. And now you've got iPhone and iPhone plus for the eight, the seven, the six S you have the iPhone SE, and then you're going to have the iPhone 10. And I don't, I, that's just so uncharacteristic of this company. My background's a little like yours. I used to be an Apple yeah. product specialist for a department of energy facility. Um, and I came into iPhone really late. I came in on the three S um, yeah. at the same time as I started playing with some Android handsets. And, and I kind of just, just made my decision that I was going to, I was going to veer over into Android uh, for most of my daily drivers. But one of the things that I could always count on was a simplicity of consumer dialogue. Apple yeah. used to just get to the point in a way that was really easy to understand and they were really good at driving the market. This is what you want. Yeah. This is what you want. And now it's like, oh, well, you want a big phone? We've got that. You want a little phone? We've got that. Do you want an all screen phone? We've got that. Do you want a tiny little phone? We've got the SE. It feels a little like an iPhone flea market right now. Yeah. <laughs> Not it, like so, a really. I think this is a weird transitional year for them. And to be honest, I guess it's kind of a necessary thing if they want to, I guess, uh, I don't want to say catch up with the times because they're really advanced as far as like internal technology goes but yeah. like smartphone design has evolved past what apple's doing obviously like there's totally. no you know there's no there's no denying that does smartphone design and and everything has evolved past them their internals kill it like they crush every single phone on the market with with their their processor setup and stuff which is oh, yeah. amazing like like this is faster than 
a MacBook you could buy like three, four years ago. <laughs> I mean, I, I know like we're not really supposed to put too much stock in benchmarks, but when they're yeah. pulling numbers that are reminiscent of Core i5s, yeah, like I mean, obviously doing something right. But here, let's let's just put it this way then: if you don't want to put put any any, any like uh, any faith or trust in benchmarks, this can edit 4K 60 video. A MacBook from four or five years ago couldn't. <laughs> Can't. Right. Exactly. So, you don't need benchmarks. The proof is in inside of the phone. And uh, like I said, I just think that it's a weird transitional year for them. I, I wonder if part of it was just like maybe a corporate fear. Obviously, a majority of their money is coming from iOS. Like Apple is really, you know, making their nut on iOS mm -hmm. these days, not from yeah. their other product lines. Do you, I, I wonder if maybe the fear was they couldn't survive with a thousand dollar iPhone 10 and last year's iPhone 7 that it was just too big a leap to not have something in between those two even if it did mean really kind of fracturing their user base to a degree yeah I, I mean that's got to be a concern N numbers and investors are always like their like primary like concerns mm -hmm. basically I, I mean they start every keynote with numbers pretty much so oh yeah that's always a big earnings always a big thing for them um the, the interesting part is though that uh, and this is kind of semi unrelated is that I, I believe it was what when they announced the iPhone 10 that the stock dropped like 4% or oh, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. um, because it was so so much further out than the regular phones and doesn't that it pushes into their next quarter or something like that. Yeah, it, it means that their their next earning cycle is not going to be reflective of their crown. Jewel. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like, that's interesting in itself. And and the other interesting thing is, I was talking to now who knows how much they actually know, but I was talking to one of the uh, business reps that I work with at the Apple store and he was like, oh, you know, this launch of the eight and eight plus it was it, it was by design, right? Like, so they, mm -hmm. they obviously want people to, to buy the iPhone 10, but then there's that segment of people, which is probably a lot of people that don't care, like the normal people, you know, like maybe they don't care about about that. Maybe they just want to get a good phone maybe they're coming from an iphone 6 which in that case yeah. this is an excellent upgrade if you're totally. coming from a 6s this is an excellent upgrade i still, still. have family members on 5s's they've been waiting yeah. out for you know a if while, you're coming from thing. anything below a 7 the iphone 8 is is awesome like i mean it's yeah. it's awesome by itself i just i wasn't excited about it that's a whole different story <laughs> but it, i think that I think that the numbers play a lot into it. And like that the guy was saying, he's like, oh, it's it's kind of by design, but it just was a weird feeling to me to to wake up Sunday morning and still have iPhones available for launch day. Right. You, you know what I mean? Like to to get up uh two days later and it's like I could still order it and it'd be fine. Like well, I, I in years past I usually do like a morning news circuit. Um, mm -hmm. like with like a Fox LA and uh, KC, uh, K, uh, I said KCRW, um, KTLA and ABC, and no one. I, I, I felt bad. There was a tech reporter from KTLA out in uh, one of the Apple stores, and he was like, There's no one here, there's literally nobody here. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, every other iPhone no. launch, we've had lines around the block, so no one. No one's That's, outside. The that is hilarious that you say that too, because I the same thing happened to me. I got to the store. And there was literally nobody in line. Like yeah. I got to the store like not too long before before it opened too. It was it, and I was just shocked. Like I had never seen that. Then again, in other areas, I saw photos where there were a ton of people in line. So you know, it yeah. depends on uh, like I don't know if, you, if you can see that photo. <laughs> yeah. That was the photo oh, outside of the right. Apple Store, like one of the flagship <laughs> Apple stores out here. <laughs> that or town squares whatever you want to call it and right. there was zero people in line and it was just it it blew my mind because i'm so not used to seeing that and I, and you want to go up to the manager and say hey hey brah there's no line take down the yeah, little line dividers like, that like looks made, really bad <laughs> exactly it made it look like it it seriously like it was like I stepped into the twilight zone and it was like Apple in 30 years. You know what I mean? Like, oh. and, like not to say anything bad about them because people buy their stuff. I buy their stuff. Like I'm, right. I, I'm a big Apple fan, but it just, it was so eerie and it was even more eerie when by the time the store had opened, there were like maybe 10 people in line and they opened the doors and 30 staff members are clapping as these 10 people walked in. And I was like, this is weird. 
Because like, so do, so do you think that there's gonna be that sling? I mean, what? Because uh, especially from the business perspective, if I were talking to someone from Forbes, what we'd be talking about is like the slingshot effect. If, uh, for one, the iPhone 10 is finally available, do you think that we're gonna see? that excitement rekindle or do you think that this is kind of letting some of the the air out of the balloon do you think that this is letting some of the pressure off of the pressure cooker as far as uh like or pre-orders and sales for the 10 yeah i mean because we we have that notion of waiting in line i mean apple builds that community really well or they have in the past yeah. and now with this split launch you don't have that same kind of build up, that same kind of urge. You've got a lot of videos out there that are a little lukewarm on Apple, just mm -hmm. you know, because they're starting the year off talking about the iPhone 8, the iPhone 8 Plus. Um, you know, Apple's Apple's strategy doesn't really rely on the rational purchase. It's it's that emotional side of the the lifestyle brand. You know, that that's really I think what gets consumers really excited is that one product launch. You can't get it on the first day, and we've got some killer advertisements that go hand in hand with creating a sense of what this phone's going to offer. And it seems like that's getting a little deflated this year. I think it's. I think it started last year, to be honest, because even last year it wasn't nearly as difficult to get what I wanted to get. That's true. At pre-order, like I think, I think that was the year that it more so started, um, and. Yeah, I think I think it is deflating, but I think they're they're always going to have that. I I personally I get tired of the whole oh we couldn't make enough phones or we couldn't meet demand. Come on, <laughs> come on, you guys! Like, actually, just, I mean to be fair, I I I kind of want to believe them on the iPhone 10. I don't think Apple has ever bit off as significant a number of design changes from I mean, one phone generation to but the other. They're the they're what the number two smartphone maker, number three. In the world, uh, they yeah. bounce back and forth between two and three. I think right yeah. now they're sort of in a statistical dead heat with Huawei. Yeah, so like, you can't tell me that they can't manufacture phones fast enough. Like, there's no way that <laughs> I can. I, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll fight you on that. I I think they can assemble phones like no one else. I think when they have the parts, there's nothing up that that can't stop Apple from assembling. What I what I actually do wonder is do they do they actually have all the components coming in do they have those supply chains actually fulfilling for what the numbers on this phone might be and that well, for, for the first time in a while we, we were talking about you know 750p lcds there's no reason why apple couldn't source you know parts for the iphone 6 the 6 uh, the the iphone 6 the 6s the 7 all of that should be taken care of but for the iPhone 10, they've never worked with an OLED before. They've they've never worked with this kind of frame or chassis. Yeah, before. but they're but they're using they're using components manufactured by Samsung, which is probably one of the largest OLED manufacturers in the world. Totally. I'd imagine. Like and, everybody but also in being the largest, they've got to fulfill for themselves, they've got to fulfill for everyone else on the market. And Apple's OLED is a very non standard screen. You know, yeah. it's not that's it's not the thing. same. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many components here. So I think the the only, I think we can agree that the You're only two things that. <laughs> that would possibly delay the ten is the depth sensor and the and the display. Well, right? and, and and a new camera housing. This is new camera yeah. equipment. I mean, I mean that's still designed and built in house, but it is yeah. something different than what's on the uh, the iPhone eight. Yeah. Okay. Well. I just I don't know. I mean, then then you should have started earlier. No, you know? that I agree with, especially like, with, with the ramp on this. Somebody just said they started like a week ago or whatever. They yeah. they have two million done. They have 10 million more on order before launch. Uh, m my friend Cody, um, his channel is called iTweaks. He made a video about this whole thing uh, the other day. And he said, yeah, he said, oh, so they have two million on order, 10 million. Uh, or two million made, ten million on order. That's twelve million. They're expected to sell fifty million. Yeah. Come on, guys. Come on. That's like you rough. knew this from the get go. You know they knew. They knew in August or they knew in January that that's, they'd sell that's, 50 million. That 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 I completely agree with. That they could yeah. have been scaling up. It, but again, I think this definitely speaks to a smaller design and development team. You know, Apple keeps those numbers actually a little leaner than some other companies do. And, and I just want to give Apple the credit that this isn't just a different color option. 
you know it's not like yeah. a piano black iphone and yeah. that's reason why numbers are constrained that to me was really silly this one i for whatever reason i want to give apple the benefit of the doubt that this iphone has been harder for them to manufacture and launch than what we've seen over the last three years yeah i i can say and real quick though one other thing i would have loved to see <laughs> on the iphone 10 is a ceramic back that's true like that Option. wouldn't have been that difficult look at essential they did it for 699 oh. you know what's funny is like prices and quality and the and the subjectiveness that comes between those things because a lot of people gave essential crap for being too expensive right mm -hmm. uh, for what it is and while that's true and it's missing some things now you look at phones like the note the Note 8, and more specifically, the, the iPhone 10 now. And I would say that the iPhone 10 is probably close to as premium as a device as the essential phone, but without the ceramic back. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm tangenting off into, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, no, phones. but I mean, but, but this is what has made the conversation so difficult is yeah. price is not an indication of the rational component aspects, performance, things that you're apt to find. It's can a company make that broad consumer pivot where they can be enough of a lifestyle brand that they can command a premium. Um, you do get some really cool stuff on a note. Do you get enough really cool stuff on a note for you to justify a nearly thousand dollar purchase? Well, and then you look at something like the iPhone 10 and I, I, you know, I don't have it next to me right now, but it's so close to something like an LG V30. You know, here's here's the answer to your question is if they're enough of a lifestyle brand to demand a premium. Remember when they released the solid gold Apple Watch? <laughs> the edition. Yeah. Like, so that right there, that was the that was a big thing at the time for them because like yeah. that is crazy. Like up to like 50 grand for a smartwatch that's completely outdated now. Oh yeah. Uh, it's it's you know it's crazy even thirteen hundred dollars for a watch is crazy and i say that as i wear the, the the ceramic one speaking of which they should have made an iphone in this color if you've seen the gray totally. ceramic in person it looks awesome i love that gray ceramic color um but anyway yeah i mean they are a lifestyle brand but at the same time if you ask any normal person on the street what's the first word that pops in your head when i say apple they're probably going to say iphone oh yeah you know, totally. they make their, their, their brand, their main catch is iPhone and iPhone has, it's not always been like budget friendly or, or for consumer, like for everybody type of thing. Cause obviously there are, there are more Android phones in the world than there are iPhones. Mm -hmm. Um, but well, it, it's I, something that I try and balance because I don't want to, I don't want this to sound like I'm belittling the brand, but yeah. You know, there, there, are, there are other, we can point to other aspects of consumerism, you know, like mm -hmm. a $20 purse from Target can hold all your stuff, but why do we mm -hmm. see people walking around with LV logos plastered well, all over a bag, you know? That is, that is the million dollar question, literally and figuratively, depending on how much bad costs. <laughs> right, um, exactly. <laughs> but I, it's status. I mean, obviously, like, it's an obvious, and it's, you know, it's an obvious thing of like, yeah, you if you didn't care, you would have the $20 target bag because they both do the same thing. Now there are, there are other things where you can say like a $20 bag from target that's manufactured on a line. There's no QA or QC or whatever. Blah, totally, blah, blah, blah. totally, totally. Versus a 500, you know, to a thousand dollar bag that is hand stitched and everything is completely checked from top to bottom that will actually last, you know, very expensive handbags and stuff. People pass those down generations. Now, I'm not making an argument for expensive handbags. Cause obviously, I don't, I don't use them. But, <laughs> well, but I mean, but, we, we can flip, we can flip that conversation to a number of things. And again, that's why yeah. I always want to say like, I want to be careful not to belittle Apple in yeah. I think their lifestyle success. Mm -hmm. But there is something you said for you know, like I I have a, that closet behind me is packed full because I'm a bag whore. I, I really am. Yeah. Backpacks, messenger bags, shoulder yeah. slings, and in like all of them are premium bags like i've spent yeah. a lot of money on different types of bags but also the same thing if you want a good pair of jeans you know like i love me a good pair of like levi's 501s it yeah. doesn't mean i'm going to go out and spend like two thousand dollars on a pair of designer jeans because yeah. i kind of have that mental block as to what value 
I might mm-hmm. get for that. Or a pair of boots. You know, I'll spend two hundred dollars on a really good pair of work boots because I expect yeah. they're going to last me a lot longer than the gut rot forty dollar boots that you get from like a Walmart. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it's all it's all subjective. You know what people? Whenever I, if I put out something that I'm like, oh, um, this is a, a budget PC build, right? Well, it might be budget to me and the next guy, but maybe to the guy over there, it's too expensive. You know, oh yeah. So, so it's so well, hard. and isn't it funny when you do that, and then like a year later, someone drops you the comment like, "Oh, this PC is way too expensive. You should have used these parts instead." And you're like, "Well, yeah, that was a year ago." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and so it's it's it just leaves me with no words because I I don't know what to say to justify or to argue a fight any price for any smartphones right now because let's be real here most if like if you're on an upgrade program with a carrier or with apple directly you're not going to ever pay that full amount probably no you know you'll be on your upgrade plan for a year for two years and then you'll trade it in and get a new one so if you're doing those things which i think a lot of you know normal people out there are doing consumers general consumers are doing that who cares about the price you it's it's going to cost you what 25 35 bucks a month maybe and well, I mean, and, and it's the lobster pot effect, you know, it's it's mm-hmm. spending a thousand dollars seems outlandish. But you know what? I made the jump from thirty five bucks a month to forty bucks a month. That didn't yeah. feel too bad. The five dollar a month jump is where those the carriers really get you at, you know, because it, it's not <laughs> that much. What's five dollars? OK, don't get a start. Don't get a, a, a Frappuccino one day out of the month and you're good right i can't tell you like apparently i was drinking frappuccinos every day because the number of frappuccinos (laughs) i don't buy now to to afford a new phone is getting getting intense yeah and so i don't don't know i mean i can say as far as like my excitement level goes i'm a little more excited about the 10 only because i think it looks really fresh i don't like the notch at the top that's just something we're gonna have to deal with I believe it's called the unibrow. We've been trying to to call it the unibrow. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the official term for it now. I read that in a book somewhere. I I mean, I think they could have done better than that. Um, I don't know how. I mean, I'm not a design expert or yeah, know about but it's been tricky because we we've been pointing to like the iPhone eight, the iPhone seven, the iPhone six. You know, there's a lot of forehead and chin, right? Yeah. Um, but I I also wonder. What does this mean for a company that in the past has done such an amazing job? I mean, really, I mean, you can always point to Apple in the past as being one of the the top offerings for a company that could blend the function around the form, right? Yeah. And here we have literally a cutout in the screen to include function. No one's going to question yeah. the function. I think the function from that looks really cool, but Apple under the Steve Jobs era, I feel would have worked harder to make that disappear into yeah. the phone not call attention to it yeah well i i think a lot of people are even saying that an easier way to do that would be to just to make the status bar black or whatever and <laughs> right. and have it blend in it's oled it'll be invisible you know that's true that's true i mean, I, I, if, I almost wonder like if someone's gonna jailbreak and that's gonna be one of the first things they do is get rid of the ears yeah now i also wonder like you were talking about uh with their design and they're always setting things up. I wonder personally if getting rid of, when they got rid of the headphone jack, they did it because they knew eventually they would release this 10 and they needed the space for oh, that's, that's everything. That's an interesting idea. I wonder if they were thinking that far out, you know? Uh, I don't know if you saw the, um, do you watch this channel called Strange Strange Parts, I think? This guy. I don't- he made oh, a, I know what video you're talking yeah. about, though. That, he put, like, a, head, he put the a headphone, headphone jack inside of the iPhone 7, and it fit. He had to, <laughs> he had to like cut some plastic parts inside of there to make it, you know. But he actually right, right. made a working headphone jack. He installed one and put it in an iPhone 7, and there was enough space. And totally. so, there was enough that, space in the iPhone 6. It didn't really that, change much. Yeah. Yeah, that made me think, if it was set up for this 10 because obviously the 10 I'm pretty sure next year we won't have this tired design. Totally. We'll just have something that looks like the 10 and probably something else that's better without the notch that'll come out a month later. Yeah. We'll have, we'll have something like that or, or whatever. <laughs> that was a jab. 
but <laughs> we'll have something like that, right? And so maybe it was all a setup to to get to this point. And I'm fine. I don't care about, you know, at first it was kind of weird missing the headphone jack. What annoys me is that, and this is totally off topic, but what annoys me is that I can't use the same pair of headphones for my MacBook and my iPhone. Yeah, that kills me. Because I used that to really use does bother the ear yeah. pods all the time for everything. I had my ear pods in plugged into my phone and then when I was working on the computer I plugged it into the laptop like there's I just can't use the same ones anymore so that bothers me well and that the situation hasn't been fixed by going to USB-C that HTC and no. Motorola's implementations are all proprietary too so I've got my Thunderbolt ports on my Razer yeah. if I pull the headphone adapter from a Moto Z it it doesn't talk to my laptop so that's like just as bad if not worse yeah. because it's not like you've got a lightning connector on your MacBook yeah, you know, I could understand if you had a lightning connector and you plugged in your ear pods and they didn't work. Like that's that's legit broken. But yeah. to say that you've got USB audio and Android, and then it doesn't work with anything but that phone is is way worse. Yeah, and opinion. and a part of me, I was hoping, I was wishing that the 10 would have had a USB C port. Now I know there's a lot of people <laughs> that like that right. because Apple makes so much money off of MFI, MFI programs. Totally. Um, the made for iPhone stuff. They make a ton of money and it would be stupid of them, a business, stupid business decision to get rid of that on, on their devices. So I get, I get from a business strategy why they're not using USB type C, but if everything that they sell aside from the iPhone and the iPad is going to have USB type C, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Like you said, I don't want to say fragmentation, but it's getting close to that. It's kind of like it. We well, I mean, we had a we had a tweet um, come in using our hashtag, um, asking if Apple's main strength is their ecosystem. And right now, I think is one of the most delicate times. Oh yeah. For Apple, and that they don't quite have the same kind of cohesion that they used to. But their ecosystem is the reason why I keep coming back. Let, let's put it oh, this totally. way: I feel like if I feel like if they had iMessage on Android a lot of people would switch <laughs> seriously I, I i don't think it well i mean again i because we I, i've talked about this on the podcast before it's it's been one of my biggest frustrations and why i've been so apt to recommend apple products though i don't use them myself yeah. but to family and friends is because like my grandmother has no problems yeah like thinking, <laughs> going from her iphone or an ipad or a mac yeah like she understands facetime like mm -hmm. that's that's fine you know, there's no way I'm going to try and convince her like, oh, no, Allo and Duo are great. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, already, I already lost that fight yeah. with Hangouts. I'm not going back. <laughs> it's, it's a cluster of communication on Android for sure. Uh, there mess. are a lot of different. There are a lot of different. I mean, you can, you know, on, on iOS, everything you need is built in right there. I right. mean, it comes it comes in on Android too, like Hangouts does. But Hangouts is confusing for people that don't use oh, yeah. Hangouts. Well, and that I, I don't have any any faith in it. You know, I, I have every faith that Apple is going to continuously improve iMessage and FaceTime. Like, like when you launch an Android phone, phone when you turn on Android phone for the first time and you launch Hangouts, if you're just checking it out and then it's all, do you want to use this for your text messages? And you're like, uh, like, yeah, I'm thinking like do a normal I? person is like, do I? I have a messages <laughs> app here. Why do I want to put my messages here? Or they yeah. click yes and then they don't understand like, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you there. It, that's, that's what they have going for them is they've built this very solid structure of, of software integration. Yeah. Well, and I, I, it shows when you've got things like AirDrop. You know, yeah. I, I can I can I can talk to him blue in the face <laughs> well, about the different like strategies that I've used for file management, but no one cares. I mean, there's yeah. there's something to be said for a streamlined process that doesn't cover all of my needs, mm -hmm. but does an amazing job of covering the basics in a way that I think general consumers can gravitate towards. Yeah, that but one thing that does frustrate me about um the difference between every iPhone until now and the 10, or even the eight between the 10 is that the software um, user experience is, I don't know if it's horrible, but it's not horrible, <laughs> but it's not, it's not conventional to everything they've trained their customers on up to this point. Yeah. They're having it's, to break things. I think Apple has been a victim of their own success since the 6S, mm -hmm. that they have done such an amazing job of bringing consumers into mobile computing that yeah. any significant change 
actually works against their audience. And that's not to say that I think people are dumb. It's that I think they have things that they need to work on during the day. And so Apple created a platform that was really good at getting out of the way of the user. But now you've got to break some of that. Now you've got to retrain people on a few things. Now you need to move things around. Getting yeah. rid of a button, introducing gestures. I know techies are going to say NBD, but it only takes a few times for a gesture to fail before people get kind of annoyed. Like a button works 99.99% .99 of the time. If I don't swipe perfectly from the bottom of my no bezel phone, yeah. I don't get exactly what I wanted. I will understand those early teething pains because we don't change things like that on iPhones. Consumers don't have to relearn things mm -hmm. on the iPhone, and now they will. You know, you know what's frustrating, though, speaking to that is, so uh, my friend Quinn from Snazzy Labs made a video about the user experience on, an, on the iPhone X. And mm -hmm. you know that little bar that's going to be at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of like you swipe up on that bar to go home and, and, and you do everything else like that. Um, they should have done just some kind of virtual home button like they have on the Note series and stuff. Totally. That just works anywhere, you know? Well, and if you're going to introduce a gesture, we have a squeeze gesture with a button. That's what a button is. You squeeze this place and it does something. Um, if we're going to have a force pressure sensitive screen, you know, 3D touch and 3D actions, because this has been one of my biggest issues with Apple is I think they've done a terrible job of conveyance for these new features. You pick up an iPhone, you don't really have a clear indication of what apps are really going to interact with a force press. Like there's yeah. no dot, there's no circle, there's no frame around the app. There's, there's nothing to suggest that other functionality is there. And again, I think this is really uncharacteristic of Apple. That's conveyance used to be their thing. This yeah, is yeah. how, yep. you know, this, this works and this is what you can expect is going to happen when you use it. Um, I'll, I'll be really curious to see what the general user experience is. I think Do like you, the headphone jack, a lot of people are going to grumble and then no, over we'll time get used, to get used to it. Exactly. It, um, well, because here's the thing is, is from what I understand, they're conveying this as the new normal. This is how it's going nope. to be from this point forward. You know, because they said this is the future of our, of our smartphones. Like this is, here's what we're doing. This is what we're doing moving forward. You know, he, the eight is what we're doing now. The 10 is what we're doing <laughs> the rest of your life yeah. or whatever until they change it. Um, what I was going to ask you, though, do you use 3D touch at all? No. On the icons? I, I rarely no. ever use it. The only time I've ever used it is to turn up and down the brightness on the yeah. flashlight. <laughs> that is it. I, 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 so the other thing is I, I got into a, a habit when I was uh, reviewing the iPhone 7. I got into a habit of peeking and popping on emails. Mm -hmm. And then I just stopped. Like, yeah. Well, here's the thing. To keep me using it. I don't use the mail app on iOS, so I don't get a lot of the cool features, you know. Um, right. I wish I could reply in line to an email with the Gmail app or whatever using 3D Touch. I'd use it all the right. time. I do use it to archive stuff. Um, that is yeah. my best friend ever, archiving <laughs> straight from a 3D Touch. Um, but then I've also found, uh, yeah, like the same thing on the watch. You know, if I get an email, I can just archive it right there. That right. has decluttered my inbox a million times over again since that came out so yeah because I'm, I'm i'm definitely terrible like people complain about my iphone reviews because <laughs> the, the yeah. app doesn't track email like i organize it in yeah. gmail yeah. and so you'll see like i've got thirty thousand unread emails <laughs> i guess yeah cool. right um i, yeah. I wanted to because i don't want to keep you too much longer here I, I know you've got to get going you've got stuff to do today too but um on things that i think the iphone 8 has done right mm -hmm. um especially like introducing uh wireless charging as an as an approved standard using the chi uh chi yeah protocol. i can tell you that i was shocked that it was a, sta a, a standard a standard exactly i was i was quite that was that was the most surprising thing to me of the keynote is that it was chi because let's be honest they're you know they like to keep things in their close circle you know and right. and have control over every aspect of it and that and that strategy of thinking is part of what makes their product so amazing is that they have control of every little thing. They micromanage everything that comes out. You want to make a product with a lightning connector, you're going to have to buy 10,000 of those connectors from Apple. So they right. know the quality that's being put into it, <laughs> you know? Right. But yeah. that's what makes their stuff so great. Um, 
but yeah, to see them use the chi standard, that was amazing. Um, I have to say that, that also what they've done, they've done right. The cameras are, are great as always, you know, they, they really do their camera stuff. Good. I don't think that most people would have a noticeable difference between, you know, this and the predecessor. Um, I, we did a we did our I mean there is and well no that's just it we did our camera review and I may ended up making it more of a comparison against the seven yeah. the, the eight plus and the seven plus I, outside of some changes to white balance and color processing yeah. I can't see any yeah. demonstrable differences but to that same token one of the things that I think I'll be I'm, I'm most excited about and I'm really excited to see it on the iPhone 8 plus is AR is yeah. seeing Apple leverage developer support for AR kit. I don't have, have you used anything yet? Yeah, I, I, I mean, have. Just a couple of the gimmicky, like the IKEA app and stuff like that. Yeah. But... Well, I've actually been practically using that because I'm I'm moving um, <laughs> tomorrow, and so I've actually literally been. So I, I'm not using That's it with. Awesome. Uh, like I I'm using it um, for dimensions of all kinds of furniture. Because I'll find a couch on IKEA that's roughly the same dimensions as one I wanted to get from somewhere else, and I'll use right. it to place it in the room. And then they have this other app that's really cool um, that I was playing with called Magic Plan, and it makes a blueprint of your spaces. And you literally oh. take the camera and you s go around the edges of each room, and then it'll spit out a bird's eye blueprint of oh, where you that's cool. What's it called? Magic Spaces? Magic Plan. Magic Plan. I'm going to yeah. fire that up as soon as we're off of this. Podcast. So I've been using things like that practically, and it's, it's quite enjoyable. Um, now, let's be honest, nothing like that is incredibly new. Like we've been able to do similar things like that before, but Apple definitely has the advantage on AR tech. It's the best implementation so far. Yeah. And well, and that they had the faith yeah. to put it in just a regular, it's not an iPhone AR. It's yeah. not a standalone <laughs> phone. It's just, this is the, the, the Zen iPhone phone, 8 plus. Right? Zen yeah, phone yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or also that, that uh, behemoth of a Lenovo that they put out too, that had yeah. all those funky sensors on the back. Yeah. The, and, and you know what? I, I have to say too, iOS 11, back to software, had not much to do with hardware, but iOS 11 is pretty solid. I mean, it's buggy, but like yeah. what they're doing is like, it's, I mean, I hate to say this because it's such a stupid comment to make, but it's the best, <laughs> it's the best iteration of iOS ever. Like, Nobody's <laughs> who's gonna say they're gonna they're gonna Johnny Ives gonna walk on stage and say this is the worst iPhone we've ever made. You know, they're not gonna, <laughs> right. it's always the, it's always the best we've ever made. But you know, I, I've I, seen, what I, I I want that I want that press conference where it's this is a lateral move from what we yeah. put out last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But it, they they've they've done stuff right. It's just there's not you know. IP six six eight would have been great. Um, yeah. It's not the end of the world, I guess. It, to be honest, a lot of people are always like waterproofing is a necessity on phones. And I'm like, I can't think of a moment where waterproofing has ever really saved me outside of being me being intentional and going in the rain to take a picture or something. Or, or like, I mean, because even most phones being mildly splash resistant, even if it's yeah. not submergible, it's I, I, I want to yeah. go swimming with the phone. Dude. Yeah. Like the uh, the one plus five. Right. Uh, I was I was talking to one plus and they were like, hey. You know, we just want to let you know that while we don't have an official rating, you can get this thing wet. And I was like, okay, let me try it. So I tried it. Dude, I, I put it in the shower. I, I submerged it in a bucket of water for a mm -hmm. good amount of time. I made a video about this, and it was fine. It's still completely fine. So right. a lot of phones have the ability to be submerged, even on, or you know. and, and just whether or not they've gone through the process to get that actual yeah. rating. Yeah, and then at the yeah. same time, you know, Apple's warranty – isn't going to cover water damage. <laughs> right. No, no phone's warranty. Not just Apple. Any manufacturer, they're not going to cover water damage because right. it's it's a resistance rating, not a proof but, rating. But then also, it's 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 why I get so excited about that Apple commercial with the dude on the bicycle in the thunderstorm with ACDC playing in the background because it was <laughs> like that was just a baller commercial. Yeah. Um. So with with things like AR and you were saying like iOS 11, because I just to circle back to one other point that you made uh, earlier in our convers in this conversation was that notion of smartphone design having peaked because peaked, it's yeah. something I've I've been talking about for a while is. We don't really have much left for a glowing rectangle push square get app. Mm -hmm. Like yep. that's that's pretty well baked at this point. Yeah. Um, do do you think that some of these changes we've been seeing, you know, uh, there are improvements to Siri, uh, trying to build their own living room speaker, uh, putting AR 
into a phone. And then also some of the new services in iOS 11, like HEVC video recording, like really trying to get after bandwidth. What do you think Apple will do next? I mean, this is such a loaded question, but what do you think, where do you think Apple goes next? Like an iPhone nine seems like it's out of the, out of the question. We're probably <laughs> going to move forward with an iPhone 10 revision next year. Yeah. Um, do you think Apple's going to revive plans for smart glasses? Do you think heads-up displays with I Apple think CarPlay? that I think that HomeKit is one of the best well-thought-out ecosystems. Out, It works the best. It's one of the most flawless mm -hmm. smart home ecosystems um, that I've used, and there's a ton of compatibility with it. And I think that they're going to hit the ground running with that because they've laid all the basis for things like that. HomePod is a next one of those next big things that's going to mm -hmm. that's going to solidify their movement into the home and i think that they're going to go after more of that kind of stuff because that's you know like the iphone makes things more convenient as a luxury for you right like, right um but i think like helping people around the house yeah it's a luxury like but it some of these things literally make you safer and make your right. life easier as totally. opposed to just having a luxury item like an iphone some of these home kit things and, and and just smart home space in general i think that's where they're i think that's where they're headed uh they're, you know you want to be a lifestyle brand you you have to have me waking up looking at your <laughs> smart home alarm clock right. instead of the um the echo spot right like totally. amazon is crushing it in that everybody has an echo now, yeah, basically. I mean, they and want, we're calling them echoes. Like that's yeah. what's hilarious is like yeah. in one generation of products, it became like Kleenex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everybody has an echo. Uh, it, it's it's crazy. Like I think that they're gonna they're gonna go after smart home market. And and also I have to say that while the iPhone eight was the least exciting thing that they launched, for some reason the Apple Watch I'm pretty happy about. Um, now that I got the LTE working finally. Oh yeah. was a, that was a whole big mess with, with, with the launch of that. Um, yeah. But I well, think it's I mean, cool. it, it hasn't worked on any of my Samsungs. Like literally every part of like my my gear reviews with the Gear S2 LTE has been like, hey, yeah. this doesn't work. Like yeah, I can't get no, it to work. I can't LTE get LTE on smartwatches are always botched at, initially for some reason. I don't know why, but um, but but it, but it is pretty nice. I would like to see. I think it would be great if the new normal was just to have an earpiece and a smartwatch, no big screen to distract you. Just these two things, simple form of communication. You know, if I needed to look anything up or to know any information, that Siri was somehow smart enough to actually retrieve that from the internet and read it back to me. Like, right? That would be cool. Like, I would love to not have to focus all my time on this thing. And to and also, let me just say one other thing real quick is. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have not had the greatest battery life on the iPhone 8 or, or whoever on your guys' team is testing that. Um, I mean, it's 117 and I'm at 28%. <laughs> oh, wow. Maybe I use my, I do have four hours and 53 minutes of usage on here, um, which I guess is pretty solid. But I, but I mean, anymore, it's even difficult to say. I have people have been saying like, oh, I should be testing more screen on time. And, and to your point, I've been trying to move more things off of the phone screen. So if mm -hmm. I can if I can work something over audio, I'm in the car a lot, so I'm trying yeah. to do a lot of screen off usage. Yeah. It's tracking my mileage, wallet streaming, a podcast yeah. and, you know, like giving me audio alerts that's, on turn by turn navigation. That's so funny because a lot of things that we have nowadays are trying to move you off of the screen, right? We have Android Auto, CarPlay, we have the smartwatches, we have glasses, we have smart earbuds etc everything is trying to get you away from looking at this yet every phone manufacturer is making this look better <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's like right? the last gasp right it's like this yeah. is this is the last the, the the last push on glowing rectangle touch square get app and then on and, top and to of that point, like if siri could just look thing like i never want to open up yelp ever again yeah. i want to say hey siri you know i love a big old fatty burrito <laughs> I, what's five miles away from me let siri go yeah. and scour yelp and zag it and find yeah. me something that it's gonna it's gonna yeah. it's gonna know i'm gonna like yeah. that's what i want yeah totally. yeah i just want everything to make decisions for me i don't <laughs> i don't want to have to make any real decisions in life anymore I, yeah. I mean it's sad but that is actually kind of true hey but, we've got one more um oh no go ahead go ahead i was Sorry. just gonna say one other thing that that 
is kind of weird about this whole off screen thing is so I paid, you know, whatever X hundred dollars for the phone. Right. And then mm -hmm. I pay another 60 to $80 for the service. And that's all great. And then I pay $10 a month for the watch plus the cost of the watch just to leave this at home. Yeah. So I'm paying monthly to leave this thing that I paid more for. At home. <laughs> I, I, I think there's always going to be some need for that brain of our personal area network, but yeah. I would be fine if it eventually just became like, like a small square lump that sat in a pocket that had a battery <laughs> and maybe it doesn't even have a screen. It's just got, connections to all of my other yeah. various peripherals. I've got two quick questions here from Twitter uh, before yeah. we wrap up the show. Um, actually, three, if you don't mind. Uh, do you think we'll need new cases for wireless charging? No, I, I, I don't. And I think that Android has a proven track record of, of pretty much any case working with wireless chargers. I know there are some exceptions always to the rule, but uh, I've tested quite a, a good amount of cases with mm -hmm. the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, and I, I haven't had any time. issues. Yeah, and I, I just to put it out there so everybody knows what I'm using, I've been using the Samsung convertible um, nice. wireless charger, uh, the Belkin upcharge or something. I can't remember what it's called. The Belkin one that just released you know, at the Apple stores, and I've been using right. one from Rav Power. And all three of those have had zero problems with probably about 15 to 20 random cases that I have here. So... Um, Apparently, be Apple, Apple has called out like more of the rugged cases, so like thin and bumper style cases should be fine. I had an um, I had an Jules just, box. just added in the in the chat that apparently Apple says there might be some compatibility with thicker cases. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it depends on the separation. Like, I wish I had the wireless charger, but I can hold the phone about uh, a quarter inch away from the charger, and it charges. And it starts. Yeah. It it, it, it picks up that connection, right? Um, so yeah, it's going to depend. Obviously, if your case has any form of metal across the back or any <laughs> non any uh, anything that's going to interfere with the induction, then yeah, you're going to have a problem there. Like I would even think that it's possible that you could have a wallet case with cards on the back that could block that. Oh, that too. could potentially disrupt. Maybe that's you know? true. Um, um, yeah. You've got from from Thomas Byers. Do you think not having a fast charger is going to deflate enthusiasm more for these new iPhones? Wow, that's that is something that bugs the crap out of me. Let me tell you, you <laughs> give us fast charging abilities finally, and which, mind you, we've always been able to fasterly charge our phones by using an iPad wall adapter. Right? Yeah. I don't know if anybody knows that trick. Yeah, you 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 take an iPad wall adapter, you plug in your iPhone to it, and it charges your phone a little bit faster. That's been proven. But now we actually have like realistic quick charge, quote quick charge in. A USB power delivery, USB-C power delivery is what we have in the iPhone. And yes, it's what, $79 for the access, two accessories you need from yep. Apple to get that working? Well, let me tell you this. There are third-party USB Type-C to lightning cables and wall adapter, 29-watt wall adapters that will do the fast charging, and you can pick them up for less than that. But the fact that it's not included in the box annoys me. Then again... My mom don't care about fast charging. She <laughs> plugs her phone in at night, you know? Well, isn't it? Your isn't grandma that probably one? doesn't care. No, she definitely doesn't. Exactly. I mean, especially for what you're saying, leaving it it's overnight. Great, but so if you, like for me, I'm at 28%, and I'm going to pop this on the fast charging setup before I head back to my house, and I'll be good to go for the rest of the day. It's nice. Right. It's a convenience thing. And it should have been included because it's included with every other thing. And I think it would have cost them a nickel more per phone, probably. <laughs> but that's it. the margin, though. You can't cut into the margin. <laughs> I guess. But I don't know. I mean, I don't even remember the question was anymore. But it, <laughs> right. It was, oh, it was just does it does it does matter? it dull? Do you think it'll it'll like deflate any additional enthusiasm? I, I, I don't I don't, I don't think, think so. it's really going to make a huge no. Act. I, I think a lot of people are going to grumble about it. It's the thing, you know, people grumble about battery life and then they'll go out and buy an even thinner phone the next year. They're going to grumble yeah. about losing the headphone jack, but they're still going to go out and buy the next phone over the next year. I've got one more here for you from Peter Hayton uh, using the PN Weekly hashtag. Do you think there will be any improvement in the iPhone 10 camera apart from better low light zoom? No. I, I mean, it's a different it's a different sensor, so we don't know. Okay. It's the same megapixel count, better aperture. 
um, and and OIS on both lenses, which is awesome. That'd be nice. Yeah, it's good on I the mean, note. It's been nice on my note. I was just gonna say that. it's been nice on my note, um, but I don't know. It depends on how that. I, I'm I'm certain that it won't be worse. <laughs> No. Here's what I here's what I can't tell because Apple has played fast and loose with this terminology, like so. I think it was for the iPhone 6s. I can't remember, but they said in the press conference, bigger sensor, which when they meant was higher bigger resolution pixel. sensor. Yeah. And so for the iPhone 10, they kept saying this has a bigger sensor. And if that's true, and it's the same resolution, that would be like what we got with the uh, Galaxy S7. Right? Have you seen lower, the sensor on the V30 and a bigger sensor? What's that? The sensor on the V30? Yeah, it's it's the same size as the one on the iPhone. It's huge. It's it's it, the one on the iPhone 10 or the 8. No, it's it's a it's a one it's a one third inch sensor. It's actually okay. smaller than what's in the uh, like what's in a Galaxy. It looked pretty big when I saw it, saw it like just a sensor in person. But I'm crazy anyway. But <laughs> I don't th I don't think it's gonna be worse, right? I don't think that. Right. It's gonna be worse. I think that it, it it'll be just as better as the seven compared to the eight, right? Like it's oh, better okay. under a, ma a magnifying glass to a trained eye, but your my mom and your grandma are not gonna notice. No, that's what I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say is that it's, you know, I, I mean, well, because we have a clear a, a clear sense of what Apple's gonna be doing for image processing. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's taking the raw file, uh, applying color, contrast. You know, we kind of have a feeling of what that's going to look like. I don't think the iPhone 10 is going to be drastically different there. So yeah. a lot of that, I think, is already answered with the main sensor on the do iPhone. Do we know 8. what sensor is going to be on the 10? Have I mean, they haven't announced it, but I'm sure Sony has the mobile sensors that they've made. They're probably using a Sony sensor, and if if they are, then there's probably out there somewhere what sensors they've released and we could narrow down which specific one they're probably using in the 10 since it's out already. Apple's notorious for using sensors that have, or things, parts that have been out for a little for a while, while, you know? Yeah, definitely. And just making them better because their software and their processing is on point. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it's going to be better, but I don't think it's going to be like dr jaw dropping, like better. Yeah, I don't. I I agree. I don't think it's going to be um, rocking our worlds. Uh, we do have one question here for um, uh, about Samsung. If you want to take that too. Yeah. Um, this is also from Peter Hayton. If Samsung doesn't change next year, do you think we'll have the same conversation about their designs being too conservative? I think that's exactly what's going to happen next year. Actually, you think it's going to be kind of a TikTok strategy? I I think it come it go it, cir it all circles back to the 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 point I made of that we're at a pinnacle. Of smartphone design and and internals as well you can make a snapdragon 890 you know whatever you want to put in a phone yeah sure it'll be faster but what more can you offer on a glass slab with the screen on it you know like what right. more can you do <laughs> and that's not a bad thing that's just how it is that's a great thing look at how far we've come in 10 years yeah. like it's crazy like it is crazy how how much things have developed i think that it's probably going to be iterative just like it was this year everybody this the big thing this year was everybody was like oh it's an s8 plus with a pen <laughs> right. that's what a lot of people were saying and while that might not be true i know a lot of people the note people will argue with that and, and and it's not i mean it's you buy the note for one thing and one thing only the s yep. pen that Stylist. is it because you can get a big display maybe not quite this big but you can get a big display on any other phone any other samsung phone Certainly yeah. the S8 Plus, um, but you buy it for the experience that the pen offers, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know what else they could do next year to be. Yeah, sure, they could drastically change the design. Maybe, maybe we'll see a flop. Maybe Samsung will go to glass and aluminum on the back next year. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I would love to see any manufacturer work with something other than glass. I, I've been saying like yeah. I want I want a, a leather back phone like. The old Moto Makers. I oh want my God! Kevlar, carbon fiber. That was amazing. And the the G four, right? The, yeah, the G four. Yeah. yeah, the G four had a leather back too that I really enjoyed. But yes, the Moto Maker stuff was awesome. I really liked the 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 leather backs on those as well. Like, um, it was all that stuff is really cool. And like, I think what it's like, 
six months later the moto x looks so cool because it was all worn brown mm-hmm. leather like it looked like an yep. old belt like an old cowboy belt or something like it was, <laughs> it was freaking awesome um but yeah i don't know it just we're just kind of at this point where you know like what do we, where do we go from here and we've all kind of agreed it, you know it's it's a taller rectangle and it's shiny on the back and that's how yeah. you sell a phone and and people buy them and 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 it's really just us type of people that complain about these things. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> you know, the normal people, I, I hate that we're using the word normal people, but I, I feel like the best example was your grandma and my mom yeah. are not looking at any of these phones saying, eh, you know, like they're not really complaining about it. They're just like, either I'm going to get it or I'm not going to get it. And that's right. the only thing they say, you know, um, to us, we tear these things apart and we're like, well, it doesn't have IP68. There's no headphone jack. There's no this, there, there's no that, blah, blah, take blah. Take the L. Take the L. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't know, you know. I I, I think it's I, – I may not be excited, but they're they're good phones. Yeah. You know, they did it. They, they, they did it right as much as they could do because we're at this point. I still think that the 10 should have been – the primary the yeah. primary yeah i think i think the 10 should have been the primary and a 7 with the new chip maybe could have been like the cheaper model and totally. and that and that's how it could have it could have they just they just could have rebranded it as you know iphone and iphone x you have iphone which is yeah. the cheaper model you have iphone se which is the bottom line mm-hmm. you have iphone which is basically a 7 with eight internals and you have the eight which is the full front display and then the eight plus which is a bigger full front display and that that's that's the lineup yeah i i i really think because i i think that would have helped clean up a lot of this sort of yeah. market there's a lot of stuff or market if they spectrum one more damn phone i swear <laughs> well and and again because jules and i were talking about this earlier in the show it's like an iPhone 9 doesn't make any sense. An iPhone X2, X3, what? X what? squared. That's an it, Apple. Uh, <laughs> X cubed. Um, X cubed, yeah. But, but then also, I mean, like for me, the main takeaway from the iPhone launches this year has been how excited I am for Apple services. Yeah. And, and how the hardware is increasingly becoming almost irrelevant. Like the, the phone itself doesn't matter to me as much as, you know, what, what access I get, what services I get, and what I can do with it. And I, I think Apple is definitely sort of leading the charge on devaluing a sense of the rectangle and getting through to developers and to consumers that uh, the yeah. next phases are going to be all software driven. Oh, oh, I mean, they're, they do that in every, every market, right? Like, mm-hmm. like, let's just be honest. Wireless charging is going to be everywhere now. Totally everywhere you'll go to a target and on the register this is a stretch but on the <laughs> register there'll be a wireless charging pad while you check out you know i i'm just looking at airports like how easy it's going to be to like yeah. like retrofit airports so that we don't have people sit stand you know sitting yeah. on the floor in hallways trying to charge gadgets now no, exactly it'll be it'll be every starbucks table will have one let's just be real about every single that'll, that'll probably be the first thing to convert you know oh, totally they already have it in some stores uh, they changed the game like that in software and in hardware, even though wireless charging has been around forever on Android and it's been proven and it's, it's reliable. It works. It might be slower than regular charging, but it's fine. Like it's been around forever. And now that Apple did it, it's going to be a thing. It's totally going to be a thing. You know, well, you take the headphone jack away and it became a thing on other phones. <laughs> surprisingly. <laughs> Much to my chagrin, because I really yeah. do like all of my old like mixing headphones and monitors yeah. and stuff. Um, but Dom, I really want to thank you for uh, jumping in on this conversation. You were exactly yeah. the guy that I wanted to to have this <laughs> chat with. Again, I, I really enjoyed your videos. Um, first, where can people get in touch with you on the Twitters, on the socials? And what do you have coming up on YouTube? What are you going to be working on next? Twitters and socials. Um, it's uh, everything.com forward slash Mac mixing M I M A C M I X I N G or youtube.com slash Dom. You can find all my stuff there. Uh, as far as videos next go, um, I'm hoping it's pixel stuff. Uh, I, I, I'm actually doing a, a, a pretty, a pretty intense PC build pretty soon here too, which is going to be oh, like right a crazy 16 core. 
Um, doing Threadripper? You're going to do yeah, Threadripper I'm doing build? Yeah, I'm doing a Threadripper build with hopefully two Titan XPs and nice. 128 gigabytes of RAM, and everything's going to be water-cooled. So. Awesome. That's that's when I'm, all my water cooling components just showed up while, while we were on the podcast. So I'm like, that's now, I'm getting going on that next. Because I need to do something like that for video editing. Are, are you also going to be mm -hmm. like uh, Twitch streaming or anything with that rig? No, just it's just for production stuff. I mean, it's I have another one like down down at, under my desk behind me that it, it's replacing basically. Um, so yeah, it's just mainly production stuff. You know, it's it's what we do. We edit videos and stuff. So it's like. A, it's a lot of money to put into a PC, but at the same time, it's <laughs> it's like it's like trying to sell coffee without a coffee shop, you know? Right, exactly. Yeah, and and my old six core Intel is definitely starting to show its age. You know, it was such a monster when I put it together, and now it's <laughs> what four K sixty frame per second video. Ow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this this machine will will definitely be able to edit eight K footage like butter. Not that I'm gonna start shooting in eight K, but. Well, I, I'm dying to get my hands on like a 360 camera in 8K. Yeah, I, I want to see because I think that will be that will be when we can start seeing an HD field of view yeah. where you look because yeah. you have to have all of those dots wrapped around your head. Um, I think well, I think that too we'll see a 360 camera from Apple next year. I hope so. I, again, if they, they would if, if they can move the needle on stuff like that because right now 360 is fun, but it's such a pain in the ass to work with. Yeah, and if any company can actually polish up that experience, I would it's expect Apple. it would be someone like Apple. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, uh, we're gonna do our wrap up spiel. You can you can stick around for that if you like. But again, I want to thank you for joining. Definitely check out Dom's channel. Uh, definitely check out um his because uh, the videos that brought us to him are his videos, sort of his editorials on the iPhone. Definitely want to watch those too. Some really great insights on products that I think we're all using, especially away from my more Android centric worldview. <laughs> Um, there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show's over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where you can find Jules is at Point Jules, and I'm humbly at Some Gadget Guy. Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube, and our home site, PocketNow.com, and for Spanish speakers, es.pocketnow.com. Shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and by dropping reviews wherever podcast reviews can be left. Once again, we want to thank this week's sponsor, Audible. Definitely hook yourself up with a free audiobook, uh, audible.com slash pocketnow. They're helping us keep the lights on, but ultimately there wouldn't be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure you tune back in.